Hi, welcome to Ecology. I'm Susan Glenn, and I'm going to have a series of presentations that cover various topics in ecology. I am basing this on the textbook Ecology Concepts and Applications, which was written by Manuel Moles and Anna Scher. This is the eighth edition, so it is uh, the publisher is McGraw Hill, and it was published in 2019. The introductory chapter will give you a definition of ecology as being the relationship between organisms and the environment. This seems fairly straightforward, but it's actually quite complex. There's a lot of different scales we could be looking at. So a few examples in this introductory chapter helps you get an idea as to the different types of approaches you could take to doing ecological studies. Uh, one of the terms that people often throw around is the, the idea of an ecosystem, and I just want to make sure we define that up front, that an ecosystem is not just the organisms living in the area, but it's also that environment. It's the physical environment with which these organisms interact. So these organisms are interacting with the water, with the air, with the abiotic environment, but also dealing with other individuals of their own species and dealing with other individuals of other species. When we look at the uh, overall organization then, and if we start with the whole planet and everything living on the planet, you're dealing with the entire biosphere. And even the entire biosphere is interacting with the atmosphere, the carbon dioxide and the oxygen, the sunlight coming in, and the biosphere is also interacting with the soil, which is being broken down from the, the surface of the planet. Normally in a biology textbook, you'll see some sort of organizational chart of the hierarchy of looking at biological um, components. With uh, an ecology textbook, then we, we uh, are basically starting that chart at the individual level. Instead of talking about atoms and molecules and cells and tissues, uh, we do talk about those things, but in the context of how the individual is relating to the environment or what's affecting the population. So if we just take this, uh, the smallest scale here, uh, you could be looking at individuals and how they're regulating their water balance in a, a semi arid environment, such as, as uh, these zebras. Or you could look at what factors are comp controlling their population if we go up to look at the whole population. But that population is going to interact with other populations, and so you might be looking at the impact of predation on it. Or you could be looking at the, the species within the context of all the other species in the community. So you could be looking at uh, community ecology and how are they um, actually living together and feeding on that, that same system. Move further up, we could be talking about ecosystems. How does fire affect the nutrients, uh, the nitrogen cycling, the, the carbon cycling in the ecosystem? Uh, you could look at landscape ecology, where you just don't look at one type of ecosystem, but we're looking at several across the landscape. And how are, are the uh, organisms moving from one patch to another? Are they able to get from one place to another? Are they moving nutrients from one place to another? We can look at the regions, we can look at the biomes, we could look at the geological history and how has that affected the diversity over a certain area or even just within a certain group of organisms. And then biosphere ecology is much more important now that we realize that uh, the increase in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has had global consequences, changing global temperatures, changing the flows of the uh, air, the flows of the ocean water, and uh, how is that affecting the ecosystems. One of the first examples in the chapter of, of a study that they uh, talk about is a classic study that was done by uh, Robert MacArthur when he was a, a graduate student in the 1950s. And he worked in Maine in the spruce woodlands. And he was interested in basically how things are able to coexist in the same environment without competing with each other. And, and uh, he looked at these really cute little songbirds. These are warblers. And uh, he was trying to figure out how they were all living in these spruce trees 
and not sort of driving each other out of the area. And he published one of the most cited bird ecology studies of all time called Population Ecology of Some Warblers of Northeastern Coniferous Forests. And that really launched his career. He, he is, Robert MacArthur comes up several times in the chapters uh, throughout the textbook because he contributed so much to ecology. So the study of these warblers, we're looking at uh, five different species of warblers in these uh, North American spruce forests and how they are interacting. And the theory is, theory predicts that if two species are using identical ecological requirements, they can't coexist in, indefinitely because at some point one will have uh, some sort of uh, an advantage, a slight advantage over the other, driving the other to local extinction. That, that population would disappear from that area of spruce trees. So how do these species coexist? Well, Robert MacArthur went out every morning early uh, in the dawn so he could hear the warblers and uh, feed the mosquitoes and and listening for their songs and trying to identify them and find them in the trees. And he actually was able to map out what they were eating and where they were eating it in the trees. And he found that the warblers had different feeding zones. So some were found feeding at the branches at the tips, some were found feeding um, at the bottoms of the trees, some were close to the trunks. So they were eating in different zones. They were partitioning this environment into different sub-environments. And so the way the warblers view these trees was not at all how we viewed them. We view them oh, it's in, living in a spruce tree um, and one spruce tree part is just like another, but to the warblers, these were very different habitats within the spruce trees. And so uh, they were not actually in direct competition with each other because they were able to partition uh, their habitat. So they coexisted by feeding in different zones in the same tree. Just for a little update, 60 years later, um, a graduate student, uh, Bick Wheeler, was, uh, went back out to these plots that uh, MacArthur went to in Maine, and he actually found different warblers showing up in different places. The system was not stable. It was dynamic. It wasn't static. Uh, things were coming and going, new species coming in, old species moving out, and uh, that way uh, you understand that these uh, ecosystems are constantly changing. You are just seeing a snapshot in time when you're going out and studying these. And it's important to go back and repeat and see what was what's going on now and what is influencing the same species. Now on a different kind of uh, study on nutrient budgets, uh, we're looking at the nutrients in the tops of the forests and the soils in different places. So this is a, a type of eco ecology. And there's a, a lot of different ways you can be doing this. Um, you could be looking up in the tops of the forest. Uh, there's some places where they have these canopy cranes. Uh, the use of drones now is really popular. It uh, saves you climbing to the tops of the trees. Uh, and finding that uh, in the canopies of the trees, you have uh, different zones and different characteristics uh, in the physical environment, which is going to impact your uh, biotic and, and response, the different types of animals that you're finding in those areas as well. Uh, because of heavy rainfall in the tropical rainforest, the, the soils are really nutrient poor. The nutrients just get washed out of them constantly. And so when you're looking at where are the nutrients in this ecosystem, they're up in the tops of the trees, they're in the canopy. So trees are sucking that stuff out of the soil as quickly as possible as things break down and putting it up in the tops of the trees. Um, and sometimes you can find these other plants growing on the branches and the trunks of the trees that uh, are just using them for support. They're not parasites. They're just sort of sitting there uh, gathering nutrients. And those are called epiphytes. <laughs> 
And the epiphytes can actually start to produce their own ecosystem. They trap water. They can have soil building up where the, the, their leaves are, are breaking down. And uh, that can have start to trap quite a few nutrients just up there on the tops of the branches. And uh, it's such an important thing to get nutrients in the tropical rainforest that the trees can actually send up roots up the sides of their trunks right up to the epiphyte mats so that they can uh, get some nutrients out of that. Now, not all forests are the same. So if you look at forests in New Hampshire, where we've got eastern deciduous temperate forests, um, they find that because there isn't nearly that kind of rainfall, when the, the leaves fall in the fall, they get broken down by the decomposers and the detritivores and about 90% of the nutrients are then in that soil organic material you know that's a nice rich topsoil that's why we cut down the trees and and made farms there and uh, only about nine and a half percent was uh, the nutrients were tied up in the vegetation when you looked at was was rushing into the streams less than one percent so a very different system um, ended up with extremely different nutrient uh, budgets so this is looking at ecosystems uh, operating in different ways in different locations Another example in this first chapter is looking at vegetation change from uh, very large spatial scales over long periods of time and looking at fossil, fossil pollen records. And this was work by, done by uh, Margaret Davis. And uh, we find that there's a lot of environmental changes over uh, time that is happening so slowly we don't really see it in our lifetime or they can be over such broad spatial scales that we don't really recognize these things are changing. Margaret Davis looked at plant pollen deposited in lake sediments in uh, lakes and ponds in the Appalachian Mountains and uh, she was able to then document from looking at the fossil pollen you can identify the different species so these would be wind pollinated species and a lot of our trees are wind pollinated uh, so our maple trees and our pine trees and spruce and fir and beech so these pollen will float around in the air and some will settle in these ponds and down in the if it, in the bottom of a very deep pond, it'll leave layers of sediment like you would have uh, tree rings. You can go back through these layers and see what was growing at different times. So this is, uh, she looked over a large area and she was looking over a large time. So we have some regional ecology over very long times. This is just looking when you're doing these uh, pollen samples. If you have a deep enough pond or lake and uh, so that when the wind is blowing over the surface or when it's freezing and thawing in the spring and fall, it's not going to stir up the sediment in the bottom. You'll have a very small surface area. So if it's kind of not so wide, but it's very deep, you get these, these uh, pollen uh, layers in the sediments and you can do carbon dating to figure out how old the different layers are. So you can see on the right here, um, around 12,000 years ago, when the uh, glaciers melted the spruce trees came back first in these areas and you can see the spruce trees have these pollen grains with these giant air sacs to one side so they're floating around and uh, so they came back first and then around 8,000 years ago the beech trees made it that far so the beech trees were moving back into that area as things are warming up and they have uh, beech nuts on them. And then we can see 2,000 years ago, the chestnuts joined in, and the chestnuts became the dominant tree in these eastern deciduous woodlands. We wiped out the chestnuts um, because we brought in a, a fungus, a, a chestnut blight that attacked them. And that actually wiped out the dominant tree from our eastern deciduous forest. So at that point, we don't find that pollen in the pollen record anymore. And these uh, the chestnut trees then are, are not the dominant tree. We now have oaks as a more dominant tree. And uh, so the animals are eating acorns instead of chestnuts. And this is looking closer at that pollen diagram where you can see the change in the pollen grains. So the way you do this is you take a sample from the bottom of the pond or lake. It's easiest to do this uh, if you're in the northern areas in the wintertime because you can walk out on the ice and put a th hole through the ice. Otherwise, you go out in a boat, take a core, 
bring that back. You burn the, the soil out of the core and uh, the dirt out of the core, and you're left with these silica uh, shells that are around the pollen grains so you can identify the different species. You can also be looking at things on um, landscape level where you're looking at going from one ecosystem to another. So Margaret Davis was looking at looking going from one ecosystem to another over time. Bruce Milne looks at transitions between ecosystems over space as part of landscape ecology, uh, looking for the edges between um, the types of vegetation. So is it a gradual change from going from an open meadow into the forest or is there an abrupt change suggesting that areas with gradual change in the landscape are likely to have uh, biological responses uh, to some sort of gradual change in an environmental factor. So ecology is a study of relationships between organisms and the environment. There's a wide variety of approaches. You can be looking at large temporal and spatial scales, um, a range in those from uh, things that are very short term to long term, things over small spatial scales to large areas. You can do field studies. There are lab studies we'll be talking about throughout this, these lectures. Uh, you can do observational studies like the warblers, just see what's going on and using that information to actually test your hypothesis. Mani manipulative studies where you actually change what's going on out there. So, so MacArthur could have gone and removed a warbler species from those trees and see do the other ones take up that space. So you could do manipulative studies. So we talked about an overview of ecology. The MacArthur study with the birds, we talked about different forest nutrient budget studies, looking at the pollen uh, studies of Margaret Davis. So got sort of a bit of an overview of the nature and the scope of ecology. Um, in this textbook at the end, there's a really nice set of appendices called Investigating the Evidence. Uh, I recommend taking out the first one, look at the first one called The Scientific Method, Questions and Hypotheses. Um, and then uh, in that, you've seen The Scientific Method before, and uh, remember that this is constantly uh, making questions, testing hypotheses, making predictions, looking at your data. So a lot of the textbook, we're looking at, at tables and graphs of the data and addressing hypotheses. And we talk about experimental design. So making sure that we have controls, that we have replication, and uh, coming up with conclusions on whether we're supporting or rejecting a hypothesis, whether things are consistent with the hypothesis or not, and uh, changing your hypothesis in view of the new information. Uh, this chapter has some concept review sections with um, questions, so you might want to review these particular questions. And then there's questions at the ends of every chapter. Also, take a look at it as you're going through the book. Uh, the, the figures are really nice and the photographs are really nice. They have really nice captions on them that give you a lot of information. And the, the graphs will show little uh, arrows telling you what to pay attention to. The next chapter is called Life on Land. So we're going to be talking about large scale patterns of climatic variation. And then there will be a separate presentation going over each of the uh, terrestrial biomes. See you then.